Hi. Um, so the echinoderms and the chordates are deuterostomes, and there's a few other groups, in the, a few small groups in the deuterostomes as well. Remember, deuterostome is a type of early embryonic development. Most of the rest of the animals are protostomes or neither deuterostomes or protostomes. So deutero is second, stoma is mouth. So deuterostomes means during gastrulation, the mouth forms second. So that means the blastopore forms the anus in deuterostomes. And it used to be thought that, again, like so many of these other categories, this would be a good way to classify all animals would be whether they have deuterostomic or protostomic development. And that turned out not to be the case. So deuterostomes, within the deuterostomes, the echinoderms, the chordates, the hemichordates, and a few other ones we'll talk about, they're all deuterostomic. But there's a few other groups, like within the arthropods, most insects also have deuterostomic development. So it's not all deuterostomes aren't included in the deuterostomes, is what I'd say. Um, it's useful for grouping the echinoderms and chordates together, but just remember that deuterostomy is, if we include all the deuterostomic animals, it would not be a monophyletic clade. Uh, in fact, it wouldn't even be paraphyletic, it would be polyphyletic, which as you remember from chapter 26, that is not good. We do not want to have any polyphyletic clades, um, which would mean we include things where uh, we have multiple groups that don't share a recent common ancestor. So we'll spend the most time here talking about the echinoderms. And the name here, echino is spiny, derm is skin. So the echinoderms are the spiny skins. So that means the, the sea stars and sea urchins, which especially sea urchins are generally very spiny. And then within the chordates, we have the vertebrates. And we will talk about them. We have a whole chapter for them because, of course, we like to spend the most time talking about our own phylum. Uh, and deuterostomes have a very similar early development, even though there's a few other animals, as I mentioned, that have that. Uh, the deuterostomes that we're going to talk about is deuterostomes, the echinoderms, the chordates, the hemichordates. DNA has shown that it is a clade. It's a monophyletic clade, those groups. But not if we include uh, the deuterostomes that we find in the ectozoa, that then it would no longer be a clade. So we don't include those. So here's our little categorization again. So now we're down here in the deuterostomia. And most of these, remember, are protostomes, but except for a few, so it, that's why we don't label this group the protostomia because they're not all protostomes. Okay, so the hemichordates are a really interesting small group that are of great interest because of where they lie in the phylogeny. So if we only had chordates and echinoderms, that doesn't give us an outgroup or another group for comparison. It's never good to just have two groups when you're doing DNA comparison. So the hemichordates are often used as an outgroup because they are, well, they're more closely related to echinoderms than they are to chordates, and they're considered a sister clade. Um, they're often called the acorn worms because their heads kind of look like acorns. Um, but it's a small group. They're mostly marine. Uh, they're mainly only interesting <laughs> because of where they are in the phylogeny. They don't really do anything interesting. Uh, chordates, which we'll talk about again in the next chapter, big nine, phylum. We will talk about some primitive chordates. The first and oldest fossil chordates, which is this species right here, Picaia, from the Cambrian explosion. So the Cambrian are the oldest chordate fossils that we have, or probably chordate, uh, because we are only dealing with Fossils, um, sometimes we can't be 100% sure that something belongs to a particular phylum, but uh, this looks, it looks like the chordates first appeared during the Cambrian. Uh, chordates are coelomates and also show segmentation of muscle blocks. Now you might think, well, we're chordates and we don't look very segmented. Think about your vertebra. Think about the repetitive structure of the human vertebra. We are segmented. 
Um, echinoderms are invertebrates, of course. Uh, so these are, this is the big nine phyla, phylum that's closest to the chordates. We share a lot of traits with echinoderms, which uh, you should keep in mind what traits we share with the echinoderms, considering that that's in the deuterostomes with us. So we share deuterostomic development with the echinoderms. We also have uh, an internal endoskeleton, of course we do, so do echinoderms. They have an internal endoskeleton that is made of collagen and has calcium as a hardening agent, just like we do. Um, although after that, um, every comparison goes off the rails. Uh, most echinoderms as adults look radially symmetric, although it's not true radial symmetry. Uh, usually echinoderms are all um, separate genders, males and females, uh, not hermaphroditic. Um, here's a nice little video of their tube feet moving. Uh, the tube feet are quite small and on the ventral side. So usually if you see a starfish moving, you don't see their feet. So uh, see the little feet moving. And they, they do have muscles, and they also use water pressure to keep those tube feet inflated. So now some nice lab person has flipped this starfish over onto its dorsal side, and the poor starfish now has to try to flip back over. And it does it relatively quickly in less than a minute because, of course, it's quite vulnerable to predators if it's on its back. So there it goes back onto its ventral side. So even though echinoderms sort of look like most of them, look like they have radial symmetry as an adult, they're actually not radially symmetric. They are bilaterally symmetric, and we can see that most clearly in their embryonic stages. So this is the first larval, oh wait, let me go back to my pointer here. So this is the swimming larval stage of an echinoderm, um, and you can see that it's clearly bilaterally symmetric. I can draw a line down the middle here, and it's two mirror images, so it's bilaterally symmetric. They change to their five-way symmetry. Most have kind of a five-way symmetry. Uh, it, the, it, while they're uh, um, going from the larval stage to the adult stage, in fact, the adult uh, with the five-part symmetry kind of develops inside the larva and kind of grows out of the larva and one side of the larva. It's very weird. Um, so the living echinoderms, we divide into five groups, and I'll show you a little picture of each one of these groups. The sea stars, the asteroidae, we can see the word star right in there, aster. Ophiroidea, the brittle stars. Echinoidea, sea urchins, and the sandals, because we can see that now we know echino is spiny. So we have the name spiny right in there for the spiny sea urchins. Crinoidea, the sea lilies and feather stars, they're, they're really weird. And the holothuroidea, the sea cucumbers. The sea cucumbers are the only ones that don't have this mostly five-part radial symmetry as an adult. They, they keep their bilateral symmetry as an adult. Um, sea stars, these are probably the most familiar to us. They typically have five arms. They are um, carn carnivorous. They attack bivalves uh, like clams, and they're very strong. They can actually open the clam shells. Um, they have the ability to stick their stomach outside of their body and grab something and digest it outside of their body, which is really weird. They can regrow lost arms. In fact, for some of them, that is a strategy to escape predators. If something grabs them, they will let go of one of their arms and get away because uh, that's a small price to pay to survive, to live another day. Um, 
Ophiroidea, the brittle stars, they're called brittle stars because their arms break off really easily. And again, this is a something that has evolved by natural selection as an escape strategy. So they again are predators and scavengers of dead things. But if something grabs one of their arms, it will break off quite easily and allow the brittle star to get away. Echinoidea, the sea urchins and sand dollars. Um, these are slow moving. They are generally not carnivorous. They can be scavengers. Many of them eat seaweed uh, and algae. Um, they, their spines are their defense and many of them are extremely well protected and some of them their spines break off when they stick into something kind of like a, um, a porcupine making them extremely unpleasant to eat. But there are things that do eat them including sea otters uh, love to eat sea urchins because once you get past the spines they're quite tasty inside. Um, the crinoidea, the sea lilies, and feather stars, this is a very ancient group within um, the echinoderms. There are fossils of sea lilies and feather stars that are hundreds of millions of years old. They are quite old. Uh, they use their long arm-like protrusions for walking, um, and they also are filter feeders in the uh, water column. They have re they're really an ancient and very little changed group. Uh, the sea cucumbers, sea cucumbers are, well, they look like a cucumber. That's why they're called sea cucumbers. They are, some people eat them. They're especially in, um, uh, around the Galapagos. There's a lot of fishing for sea cucumbers. They don't really look like the other echinoderms. They don't have spines. Um, they do have the little tube feet, though, that the rest of the echinoderms do, and they have deuterostomic development. And DNA shows that, in fact, they do belong with the echinoderms. They are not a separate group, as was thought many decades ago before we had DNA. So here's our little summary. Uh, and this is, this is in your book, this little summary slide. The big nine phyla are on here plus a couple of extra ones. So the syndermata with the rotifers that's not in the big nine and the lophophorates, the ectoprocta and the brachiopods are not in the big nine either. All the rest of these that are listed on here, these are big nine phyla. So for the big nine phyla, you should know the basic traits of the big nine phyla, how they fit in with the other ones like are they in the ectocyzoa? Are they in the lophotrichozoa? Are they deuterostomes? Are they one of the basal groups? Um, that's what you need to know about the big nine. How would you recognize if I, if you if I gave you a novel organism that you'd never seen before? How would you know which phylum to place it in? Because really, that's what scientists do. If they find something, if scientists are you know, out scuba diving in some remote area looking for new species and they find something that they've never seen before, that's the first question that they ask is, what phylum does this belong in? If it's an animal, what is it? Uh, does it look like it's a mollusk? Does it look like it's an arthropod? Um, is it an echinoderm? That's the first step in trying to figure out what it is. And if it doesn't fit into any of the known phyla, Maybe it's a new phylum, like the one that was discovered in 1995. Okay, uh, that's the end for this particular chapter. And the next chapter, we're going to talk exclusively about chordates, mostly about vertebrates.